Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our complimentary webinar series for U.S. federal government contractors. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. today. This webinar series will run for 15 weeks or on 15 Wednesdays as we cover subcontracting opportunities within each of the 15 federal departments. As usual, all webinars are complimentary and you can find the schedule, registration links, and recordings on our website under the subcontracting section. Our data partner each week is GovSpend, formerly FedMine, and our legal perspective will be covered by a rotating government contracts attorney each Wednesday. So a little bit more about us. As you can see on the slide, we provide the following services for federal contractors, including product, service, and software firms across the globe. So you can find more information about us on our website. Our webinars and newsletters reach a vast array of federal contractors, and our YouTube channel now has almost 600 complimentary webinars. We're adding to that every week. So you can follow our channel and give our videos a like or a comment. We also offer advertising opportunities, including in this series. So if your organization is interested in reaching federal contractors, you can sponsor an event, our webinars, advertise in our newsletter, or have us promote your promotional information on LinkedIn. So you can contact us at hello at jennifershouse.com for pricing and our media kit. So there's that email down at the bottom of the screen. Please note we've added a procurement playbook webinar on doing business with the NSA. This is a live webinar only. It's not recorded. The slides won't be available afterwards. So this is definitely um, a rare and awesome opportunity. We really hope that you can join us. The government speaker will be taking audience questions during this webinar. That'll be this Friday, October 21st. I'm at 12 p.m. So um, make sure that you register for that. You can find that on our website. And now we'd like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsors who help make this series possible. Special thanks to Tom Johnson and the team at Set Aside Alert for posting this webinar series in their newsletter. Please visit setasidealert.com to learn about their services for small businesses. Additionally, we'd like to thank GovEvents and also Fairfax County for sharing this webinar series on their public calendars. You can visit their websites and calendars for other related events. We'd like to thank the Virginia PTAC. Virginia PTAC is based out of GMU in Fairfax, Virginia, and offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on your business location. So if you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to contact the PTAC. Next, we'd like to thank WorkPlan. WorkPlan is a robust enterprise resource planning software designed for government contractors. WorkPlan was created to help GovCons with DCAA compliance. And WorkPlan is a one complete solution to meet all of your needs from timekeeping, contract management, customer relationship management, cost accounting, payroll, purchasing, budgeting and forecasting, and much more. So make the switch to WorkPlan today and schedule a demo at www.workplan.com. And that's WorkPlan, W-R-K-P-L-A-N.com or call 1-866-826-3399. Don't wait, schedule a demo and see how WorkPlan can work for you. Next, we'd like to thank our friends at BidSpeed. The BidSpeed platform helps you win and increase your probability of winning government contracts. They have opportunities from every federal, state, and local public source in the United States. So if you're looking for a compliance matrix, a proposal template, a strategic teaming partner, or details on expiring contracts, BidSpeed can help. BidSpeed is an official partner of this SBA's 7J Management and Technical Assistance Program. Contact BidSpeed at the email or phone number here um, to learn more. Next, we'd like to thank Gov White Papers, an online resource for content. Gov White Papers is a free knowledge hub for the public sector and supporting industries to find, post, and promote government and military related content. Explore B2G advertising solutions with our team of expert government 
government marketers so you can connect with public sector decision makers. Promotional opportunities include lead generation, display ads, white label content creation, email marketing, and more. Browse thousands of free white papers, ebooks, case studies, and more to stay informed on topics like energy, defense, economy, healthcare, technology, and education. Plus, upload your content for free to boost website traffic and exposure in the government community. Join white papers today to get started. We'd like to thank C3 Integrated Solutions. C3 Integrated Solutions is a full service IT provider that specializes in securing our nation's defense industrial base through cloud-based solutions and industry leading partners. C3 is a provider of Microsoft government cloud solutions, including Office 365, GCC, GCC High and Azure Gov, and specializes in helping clients achieve CMMC and NIST 800-171 compliance by providing MSP security and Office 365 integration services. No matter where you are on your compliance journey, C3 can help. So get compliant and stay compliant with C3 integrated solutions. And lastly, we'd like to thank Government Marketing University um, and their GAIN conference. GAIN is the premier business to government conference that brings together the brightest minds in the community. Government Marketing University's goal is to help you grow your government Marcom wisdom, accelerate connecting with your target government audience by learning new trends and techniques, innovate your annual strategy, tactics, and tools. The on-demand event is focused on training, actionable takeaways, and research insights to help you boost your brand and drive more revenue in 2023. GAIN 2022 On Demand will be available on Monday, October 24th at www.thegainconference.com. All right, and so today we're here to dig into subcontracting opportunities at the Department of Homeland Security. So let's just take a quick look at our agenda for today. Um, as you can see, we're gonna start with panelist introductions and we'll close out with legal insights. So our first panelist today is Ms. Archisa Meehan. She's representing GovSpend. GovSpend is the go-to resource for finding federal contracting opportunities. So please contact Archisa for more information about the GovSpend platform. Archisa, thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to have you as always. Uh, great to be here. Thank you. And our legal speaker today is David Dempsey, and he's from the law firm Dempsey Law Firm. So thank you so much for being with us. Good to be here too, Mallory. Thank you. Awesome. All right, so we'll get started um, with the mission statement from the Department of Homeland Security. Um, you can read it there. Um, we've highlighted some key terms, um, but as a reminder, the Department of Homeland Security um, and their mission was born out of the commitment and resolve of Americans across the U.S. in the wake of the September 11th attacks. So that's something to keep in mind um, as we're looking at um, what business they do. And then, uh, as you can see here, we have the various agencies and services within the department. So um, we encourage you to spend some more time um, on each of these websites so you can learn more about all the specific roles and missions here. And then some quick um, links, the link to the main department website, um, as well as the small business office. Um, and then we encourage you to look at the procurement forecast to understand what the department is buying, when they're buying it, how much, and if any specific set aside or contract vehicle may be used. Um, and then lastly, we have the link to the SBA scorecard, which can help you understand the small business contracting trends and what dollars are being won by women, veterans, hub zone firms, and other disadvantaged businesses. So with that, let's look at the top 10 vendors. I won't read these off to you because in just a second, Artis is gonna go through our top five. Um, but if you just wanna make a note of these, keep them in the back of your mind. All right, and I'm gonna hand it over to Archisa now. Perfect, thank you so much, uh, Madeline. Uh, Madeline. Um, so my name is Archisha Mian, and I am federal, I'm the director of federal go-to-market at GovSpend uh, and FedMine. Um, and today we're really going to be focusing on the top companies uh, at 
at um, Homeland Security or H uh, and basically focus on how to use this information to grow our um, business. Um, so typical, so I always like to start off by talking a little bit about the data uh, that we're talk we're presenting. The prime contract data comes from FPDS, and we really pick the top ten based on FY21 data because this was we we went through this before the end of fiscal year 2022. Uh, so we looked at the fiscal year 21 information to come up with the top ten. Um, the subcontract data really comes from USA spending, uh, which gets its data from FSRS. Um, keep in mind that the subcontract data is self-reported by the prime and in some instances by the sub. And uh, typically the federal government and the SBA, when they go through the goaling and um, related reporting, look at another system that is called ESRS. Uh, However, that data set is not made public, which is why we are uh, you know, looking at the data that is made public uh, in FSRS, which feeds USA spending. Um, so how do you use the data that, we are, that is made available and that we're gonna talk about in a bit? Um, so while I'm just talking about the top 10 companies, top five companies, um, the results will change based on any filters that you might put in, whether it's keywords, whether it's NICS codes, um, you know, things like that. Um, and I always, always, always encourage companies to use uh, filters of keywords and NICS codes or socioeconomic categories or GSA schedules or GVACs um, because as part of our business strategy, we always want to be as focused as we can. A um, couple of things also as we go through the information is that uh, many times um, in FPDS, in the FPDS data, there is a small little field that says subcontract plan requirement. Um, and I always encourage people, clients and businesses to pay attention to that, to do searches that have for, for contracts that actually have a subcontract plan requirement so that you can actually create those relationships with the primes. Um, so having said that, let's go into the top first, uh, the top company based on FY21, um, Paragon Systems. Um, the website is right there. Um, here is a link to uh, find out more information and to register as a small business vendor. Uh, next slide. Um, so as you can see from this information that we've presented, uh, this company works with many agencies, um, including uh, the Department of Justice, uh, Health and Human Services, but their largest client is Homeland Security. And if you further look at the various bureaus from which they're getting the contracts, the Office of Procurement Operations is the largest one. Uh, next slide. In terms of the type of work that they do, it's mainly for protective security officers for uh, specific um, areas, uh, including LA, Manhattan, South Texas, Washington, DC. Um, and I have sort of put in a, a screenshot of how the contract requirement is. Many times you will find that contracting officer information, but what I really wanted to point out is that subcontract plan, and in this case, you could see that there is a commercial subcontract plan requirement. And, uh, you know, based on the searches that you do, uh, this is an indication that I'm sure if, if that data is not made public in USA spending FSRS, they're definitely reporting this information in ESRS for um, you know, the reporting requirements. Um, so that is something you always want to pay attention to as you look at using subcontracting as part of your uh, business growth strategy. Uh, next slide. Um, also interesting that they, this company has also received a subcontract in FY22 from Triad National Security. So um, again, if data is made 
public, you know, we will integrate that and make it searchable. But this is the type of information that you can look at and um, use it for your uh, for your own um, growth strategies. Uh, next slide. The next company that we're going to talk about is Eastern Shipbuilding. Um, next slide. Uh, this is the link to register as a small business vendor. Uh, next slide. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, the Homeland Security is their primary client, especially if you look at FY21. Uh, you know, FY20 was a really good year for them. Um, FY21 saw a little drop. FY22 definitely seen a drop. Um, and you can see that the, the main bureau within um, uh, Homeland is the Coast Guard. They are in the shipbuilding business, so makes sense. Uh, next slide. And um, you can see in this case that they have actually, um, they, they have made a lot of their subcontractors that they're working with uh, public. So in this case, you could see for the specific contract, these are the various subcontractors that they are working with. Um, obviously, you can get further into details to understand what is, what is it that they're buying from the various subcontractors, what is the price of the same two. Um, next slide. And in, in their case, since they are reporting the subcontractors, uh, this is just a quick view of all the subcontractors that they have worked with, that they have reported for FY22. Um, next slide. Uh, the third company that uh, we're going to talk about is AMR, um, a global medical uh, response solution. Um, next slide. Here is the link to uh, understand more about working with them as a small business vendor or their various partnership programs. Um, quick look at the contracts that they have won. Um, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs is, is a new, relatively new client for them uh, where they've done well. Uh, but Homeland Security in FY22, uh, uh, in FY21 accounted for $367 million with FEMA being the largest bureau with some contracts coming from the Office of Procurement Operations. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of the contracts that they have won from FEMA, you could see it's all emergency management support services for Hurricane Ida, for COVID-19, uh, a lot of work in Louisiana and Mississippi hurricane, severe winter weather in Texas. So it's it's a, a lot of emergency management support services. And again, when you go into the transactional detail, you could actually see that there is an individual subcontract plan requirement. And I actually, you could see that this little one snippet is from uh, the emergency medical support services uh, to support the tropical storm Ian that just hit. Um, I think at the time of doing the slide, we I don't believe that there was a national interest action code assigned for Ian. So, but it was, I mean, I think this was one of the first contracts I saw for Ian uh, and it does have an individual subcontract plan. So always interesting to see those connections and use it to work with these companies to, um, you know, and, and grow your business, get the past performance, um, things of that nature. Um, next slide. The fourth company uh, is the Geo Group. Uh, next slide. Um, here is a link that you could use to register. Um, next slide. Again, uh, for the Geo Group, uh, Department of Homeland Security is a very large client. Uh, as also is the Department of Justice. Um, with FY21, uh, they won more than 262 million from Homeland. FY22, they did even better at 399 million. Um, and most of their contracts at um, Homeland are from uh, US Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, next slide. Again, if we start looking at the details, you could see that there is an individual subcontract plan, and it is in this case, uh, you know, is for 
funding for transportation, medical services, um, things of that nature. Uh, next slide. And the last company that we are going to touch on is Deployed Resources. Uh, here is the link to contact them if you want to understand how to work with them. Um, again, Homeland Security is their largest client, and FY22 actually seen them almost double the contracts that they want uh, from Homeland Security. They were at 350 million in 2021, um, almost doubled, more than doubled, at to 733 million dollars in 2022. Homeland Security's, uh, sorry, Health and Human Services is also a client of theirs. And within Homeland um, Security, uh, US Customs and Border Protection is the main bureau that they work with, though they did do some work with FEMA over the past two, three years. Uh, next slide. Um, and again, in this case, you could see some of the subcontracts that they have won from Lockheed, um, and then some, uh, and specifically in which agency. So there are many ways to dissect the data that is out there and use it for understanding um, which are the possible companies that you can work with, what are the services that you can provide, um, get transparency into who are they working with, uh, what price are they working, uh, you know, are there, is the subcontract being awarded for, and get that level of trans transparency that we need to, um, you know, make uh, uh, and use that actionable intelligence to make the right decisions for our business as we are growing. Um, next slide. And I think that is the end of my slides. As again, uh, my contact information is here. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Artisa, for um, all of your data and great insight. Um, just very quickly, I'm going to go through some marketing best practices before we go into legal insights. Um, so most importantly, make sure that you're using the tools available to you on SAM.gov and the GovSpend platform to conduct research on primes um, and expiring contracts. Like we said, you can contact Archisa if you'd like more help um, with using GovSpend. So use the Primes website as well, their newsletter and events calendars, um, and social media. Learn more about them and then connect. It's really important to do all of that background research um, before connecting with the Prime. And lastly, set yourself apart and lead with your capabilities, not your socioeconomic status. Bring a specific opportunity to the Prime and work with the SBLOs, your small business liaison officers, they're your advocates, um, so definitely reach out to them. All right, and now we'll be going over legal considerations and best practices. Um, please note we've covered the federal acquisition regulations on the Department of Homeland Security earlier this year. So you can find the YouTube recording there, um, there's the link. And actually David was the one who um, covered that for us. So you can um, hear him speak on those, but for now um, I'll hand it over to David to speak about um, best practices now. Thank you, Mallory. I'll uh, begin with the next slide, which is uh, to explain the flow down clauses and uh, the matrix that's available from the Defense Acquisition University. And there, what I think I would suggest is it's, uh, they have a video there that's very good actually, and it uh, is, is useful because there's a remarkable amount of data that, uh, excuse me, search, searchable data in what the, the DAU has put together. Now there's another matrix uh, from acquisition.gov, and that one is is difficult uh, to figure out in my estimation. So I would suggest you go to the <clears throat> DAU one, and from there you can find uh, flow down clauses uh, for agencies a, a lot easier, and and uh, whether they're required or not, or or however they're going to be uh, described in the given <clears throat> agency uh, regulation. And then uh, next one we talk about 
on the next slide, we've got the DHS flow down clauses, and there's not too many. Um, in fact, I've looked through that and have not found any required flow down clauses from DHS, uh, from the DHS supplement, the uh, Homeland Security Acquisition Reg uh, supplement. So there, you don't have to worry about too much. But as I explain in the next slide, where I go over the types of flow down clauses, there are several this is the next slide, please. There are several types of flow downs and Homeland Security has uh, quite a few under number five, which I'll go over that. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So the types of flow downs are the mandatory ones. And I think the cybersecurity clauses uh, and the data rights clauses are uh, probably uh, the most notorious for that. And then there's uh, mandatory clauses which have uh, qualifications to it. Uh, for example, the small business clause uh, requires a, a small business plan, but small businesses are exempt from it. And then we have the uh, normal, uh, this is where the stress starts between primes and subs. And this is a non-commercial prime, that is they're providing a non-commercial item to the government or, or service with a subcontractor who uh, has a commercial um, contribution to the prime. And what uh, I recommend there is that at least under the FAR clause, that subcontractors go to uh, 52.244 uh, dash six C two, and there it will say that uh, prime contractors are permitted to put in a minimal of uh, contracts from the RFP, and uh, only then the qualifier there is that is it's consistent with performance for the contract. And now we come to commercial prime with commercial sub. And there, that clause there, uh, paragraph E2, uh, says only add what's necessary to performance. And as, as an aside, uh, subparagraph E1 lists the 20 questions, excuse me, the 20 clauses that uh, are, are to be flowed down to the contractor, to the subcontractor. And then we've got uh, non mandatory but relevant and this is where most of uh, the discussions with a prime will come and i'll be using the uh, homeland security regs to, to illustrate this uh, for example at, at their clause uh, which is 3052.217-95 that's a liability and insurance clause it doesn't mention subcontractor uh, but as a practical matter, the prime is going to flow that down because they want to make sure you have insurance and they want to make sure that uh, your ability uh, to handle any liability is is going to be uh, present. And so they'll, they'll flow that down. Uh, same with a guarantee clause, a guarantee of delivery. Uh, these are two Coast Guard contracts. Um, another one, which is 3052.209-75, uh, 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 relates to prohibited financial <clears throat> uh, interests for a leader follower uh, <clears throat> program, which the which the government is is involved with, and what that what this one does is say uh, you, you've got to make sure there's no financial interest in anything and that's what the prime was required to do and that would obviously be flowed down to a sub. The last one, the irrelevant or inapplicable clauses, um, I, I think those clauses can best be described as something that's required to go in all prime contracts uh, 
but has nothing to do with a subcontractor. Uh, for example, that would be that would include a requirement uh, to do certain things if you're dealing in uh, Afghanistan or overseas or something like that. The risk there or the analysis there to me is is examine those clauses that that are that you know are in the in your subcontract but aren't relevant to you and make an assessment on whether you want to consider that a self-deleting clause because it's um, the, the facts that the clause is handling are not or most likely will not occur and then if you if you want to discuss uh, the irrelevance or inapplicable nature of a flow down clause and just figure out what your leverage is for purposes of continuing that conversation. My experience is that uh, eight, nine, nine, nine times out of 10, you're just gonna consider it a self-deleting clause because the, the uh, circumstances are not gonna appear. So on the next slide, I want to get into what's uh, predictable. Uh, these are predictable issues that come up. Um, the most significant one are clauses that are known to change during the course of uh, a procurement, performance, etc. So what I've provided there is the, the FAR <clears throat> provision which says uh, changes to a clause apply to a solicitation only after the effective date. And then they go on to explain that if a, if a uh, solicitation comes out with a new clause in it before the effective date, then if award occurs after the effective date, then that new clause will apply. And, and probably the best example of that is the uh, Buy American uh, clauses which uh, will change on October 25th, i.e. next week. That's when those new clauses become the, the new Buy American provisions for uh, uh, contractors. And then of course, subcontractors uh, will come into play. And then there's the clauses subject to change, which happens all the time. And we know that from especially metals, a clause for those who are familiar with, with that. But in, with respect to cybersecurity, that clause uh, for in the uh, uh, DFARS, uh, which is 252.204-7012, says that the contractor is supposed to be in compliance with NIST 171 as of the date of uh, the contract. And there's been three changes to NIST 171 since the uh, DFARS clause came out. So that is the one that the prime and the sub are gonna be subject to. And supply chain prohibitions uh, are, are changing or, or have and, and may change uh, with respect to the Defense Department and the GSA and Homeland Security uh, over, over time and, and the supply chain problem or, or section 889 is, is what I call the Huawei clause. It's, it's a list of uh, Chinese companies where cannot have any components or subcomponents from those companies. And then occasionally there are change requirements uh, from another agency. And of course, the best example of that is going to be the Labor Department. Uh, they, they've got a proposed rule out now on uh, what is going to constitute a, um, excuse me, what, it, what is going to constitute a independent contractor. It'll be a while, I think, but the Federal Register notice was around 60 pages. 
Okay, and then uh, Department of Transportation may may change things through the uh, various requirements by the uh, Transit Authority, uh, Federal Transit, and uh, Highway. That that anyone who deals with those agencies is is already aware how those subcontracts, uh, excuse me, those prime contracts change and requirements change. And then once in a while, uh, courts will get involved. Uh, this is usually in the area of accounting, cost accounting in particular, uh, excuse me, cost accounting standards in particular, where the board or the claims court will, and then later uh, confirmed by the Court of Appeals or the Federal Circuit will then say, this is the way it's supposed to be and some changes will have to be made uh, to clauses to to the provisions which are required by the clauses. So on the next slide, I've got what I would call other predictable issues. Uh, perhaps the least understood one is the Christian doctrine, which basically says if a, if a clause, and I'm talking about the clause now, is required by, by law or by by practice, then it's incorporated by reference into the prime contract. Now, the Christian doctrine case started with the termination for convenience clause, which was omitted from the contract, but the court went ahead and said that that clause is incorporated, is, is essentially incorporated by reference um, because the government always has the right to, uh, to terminate a contract. Uh, for convenience, and, and they just say, you know, they just have to pay for it. It's questionable whether or not the Christian doctrine is going to apply to subcontracts. Uh, so in a dispute between a subcontractor and a prime contractor, it's not clear yet that the Christian doctrine will apply. I've known of one instance on a labor law decision where they seem to adopt policy that the Christian doctrine applies to a subcontract but it's not it's not clear it's not clear otherwise if uh, anyone else will will go by that now there's a, a paid when paid clauses these clauses are illegal in many states uh, but in, in the far as far reference I've given regarding non-payment, that the word payment is missing. I think there is a operator error there. But non-payment of subs is something you can go to the government on. And of course, the DOD has a policy of preferred payment or early payment uh, to subcontractors. And so you shouldn't see that even in the uh, construction world. You should not see that pay when paid clause uh, very often. And then. Uh, Probably the most uh, serious clause you have to be aware of is the dispute clause where the subcontractor has been impacted by a change that the government made and that change was uh, put in the sub, excuse me, put in the prime contract, but that change affects the cost associated with the subcontractor. And there is no disputes clause in, in the FAR or anywhere else that permits a subcontractor to file a claim against the government due to lack of privity. So the workaround on that has been a sponsorship clause where the prime contractor agrees to sponsor a subcontractor's claim and it goes through the fiction of filing the claim uh, in the name of the prime contractor. But you have to have that clause in your subcontract to do that. Uh, some companies uh, try to refuse, and then we get back to leverage again on, on whether or not um, they're going to continue with that refusal. Uh, but the, it, 
not going to be in this it's not going to be in your subcontract unless they're as a policy for that company they're they're going to go ahead and, and sponsor claims which and the clause will will say they'll sponsor you in their name but we want to see the claim we, we want to evaluate it etc before we go forward uh, with the submission in our name okay now on the, the last slide i've got what i've considered the future issues some of these I've, I've sort of gone over number uh number three on the buy american rules for example and then we have the cybersecurity interim rules scheduled uh, for for March 2023. This, this is the implementation of the CMMC <clears throat> um, system, I guess, uh, that is going through the DFAR clause, and then the clause implements the uh, NIST 171 and CMMC is is the uh, method by which that clause is implemented in, in the sense that you have to have a third party approval of your uh, uh, security plan and, and your plan of action uh, for future changes. But I also mentioned proposed rule, which is the independent contract under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which uh, Labor Department is pushing. And then we have uh, OMB memorandum. I've, I've got two there. First one is uh, software supply chain. Uh, there's an OMB memo that, that says everybody's got to keep track of their software supply so that uh, the contractor, the government, will have an idea where the software is, is generating from. That has not been implemented yet, uh, but it's going to be like, uh, from what I can tell, it's going to be similar to uh, Section 889 implementation of the absence of products from a, a particular uh, country. And then the most recent one was uh, OMB M23 01, increasing the the share of dollars to uh, small and disadvantaged businesses from uh, to 12% and then to 15% by 2025. And there may be a lot of controversy associated with that because it's, going to, it's a good chance it'll get into um, issues associated with whether something should have been set aside uh, and the consequences of the agency not uh, not counting the dollars uh, for their for their goal, where they can do that rather easily, or they can do it easily now. If it gets up to fifty percent, fifteen percent of their dollars, that could be a problem for the agencies, and then any problem with the agency is going to be. Uh, flow down to the prime then to the sub. Now my next slide, which is my, my last one here, uh, this is my observation from all these years I've been practicing procurement law. Um, if you have a lot of subcontracts, uh, make sure you have your own flow down matrix and, and that that is something that can only be done by people cooperating in your company to identify what is being flowed down and you have an idea if uh, so you have an idea of what is it, what that flow down may cost you and what the risk is if you accept it uh, and that sort of thing and, and this uh, this comes uh, up a lot when you have a uh, essentially a form contract from one of the uh, bigs, uh, you know, Lockheed, GDIT, those sorts of companies who have a list of provisions, standard list of provisions that they're going to give to you depending on the type of contract it is, firm fixed price, commercial, cost reimbursement, et cetera. And then lastly, as uh, 
obvious as it may seem, there's no substitute for reading the contract to find out exactly what clauses apply to you and what prime contractors are what how prime contractors are flowing down the federal requirements and the federal policies uh, down to you as a small business. On these two, on these two observations, I, I can't emphasize them enough. There's never going to be a matrix, for example, that that, that is going to cover every situation. So try to put one together for yourself. You'll need it for pricing out contracts and then read the contract. Uh, I've had many individuals uh, that I discuss issues with who essentially said that they uh, didn't read all the clauses incorporated by reference or they didn't read the uh, standard uh, forms from, from the larger companies indicating what they're obligated to do and essentially uh, they got they got stuck with any extra costs that may have resulted from that okay that completes my presentation and uh, thank you all for listening thank you so much david for all of your um insights there's his contact information right there, his email, um, as well as Archisa's. If you have any um, additional questions for our speakers today, you can find the recording of this webinar on our website um, and on our YouTube channel about 24 hours after this webinar. Um, and additionally, you can find the PowerPoint presentation on slideshare.com. Um, same thing around 24 hours after this. So thank you all for attending. Have a great day. This concludes the webinar. Thank you all.